So for 10 of the past 12 years, uh, MD Anderson has been voted the best hospital for cancer care treatment in the United States by U.S. News World Report. When we think about you know, that kind of accomplishment, I think the first thing we think about is probably the doctors and nurses who make that all happen. But today we have us with us two of the unsung heroes uh, who do a lot of that awesome work behind the scenes. So we have Joe Orengel, who's the managing director from Visual Risk IQ. Uh, it's a software and services forum firm. Um, they make data better, faster, and cheaper. For people like Nancy Penner, who's the managing uh, manager for systems analysis and services, and her efforts have culminated in over 200 million in annual giving. So please join me in welcoming them here. Thanks so much, Eddie. It's a, a treat to, to be here. This is um, my first uh, drive conference on um, Nancy's set. And um, we're going to share just a little bit about our, our journey to uh, how we became to work together and some innovations that, uh, that we've done together that have really made a difference for, uh, for some things at MD Anderson. Um, the, the goals for the session, we want to talk a little bit about this technology platform that, uh, that we've, we've helped with and provide a couple of takeaways for, for you all on how you can learn from, uh, from some of the successes that, uh, that we've had. Um, for those of you that I've not met yet, I'm a little bit different than many of the folks here at the conference. I come from internal audit. I'm not embarrassed <laughs> to, to share that. But that's actually a little bit about our firm's heritage. And um, for the past eight plus years, uh, my company, Visual Risk IQ, has been helping people in the audit and finance world go from looking at a sample of 25 or 50 transactions and telling you something about a million or 10 million transactions to actually looking at all million or 10 million. One of the things that auditors want to know, is this invoice in my left hand a duplicate of the one in my right? Is this vendor in my left hand a duplicate of one in my right? And we began doing some of that work for MD Anderson, gosh, five, six years ago. And um, that experience in the finance world has really helped us in, um, in development. So I'm very tickled to, to be here personally and look forward to getting to know you and understand some of the things that the business questions that you're trying to ask and answer with data so that, uh, that I can learn from you from the person. Let me uh, turn things over to Nancy, but we thought we would begin with a, uh, a video. So this kind of just sets the stage of the changes that our institution is, is going through. We kicked off a uh, major initiative about a year ago, and um, with the big, bold things that we're doing as an institution, so follows the extra work and the extra dollars that are going to be needed from the development side to fund this work. So just a, a quick little backstory on that what's driving a lot of our issues.
going to talk about all the analytics that are going to be transformed the patient care class. Other groups at the institution that have the privilege of doing that, but I thought I was going to segue because it's data and analytics for the last. And what we're doing in the development office, as I mentioned, we were challenged with uh, pretty much doubling our uh, annual fundraising um, efforts to support these moonshot um, programs. So the moonshots are focused on specific cancer areas where we're realigning um, the, the researcher, the clinician, the efforts um, around very focused um, project management oriented um, initiatives as opposed to kind of the kind way that uh, clinical science gets um, advanced. I'm not gonna go too much into that. The development office, so we had to um, expand our programs in order to start raising funds for these new workshop programs. And one of the areas that we did it um, is in our direct mail um, program. How many of you do um, acquisition? So we've had a direct mail program in place for many years. Um, it's been pretty um, conservative, I would say, um, until now. So we're growing from about three and a half million pieces a year, and we're targeting 25 million pieces a year. Um, yes. So we're going to be grabbing lots and lots of Um, so we're expanding the number of pieces mailed. We're expanding the frequency. Um, historically, we have dropped um, acquisition pieces uh, five times a year, now we're doing it every month. So we've got these cycles that are going more frequently. And in between any one cycle, um, you acquire a name and a drop that's going to go in September. That same name might be acquired again in October, maybe from a different source. And in the meantime, that person may have given and shouldn't be getting that other piece. And so there's this, this constant cycle overlap that we're dealing with. Um, so the, in the end, the risk of duplicate names getting into the database increases with this, this increased volume. So while we started using oversight and the services of visual risk um, a few years ago when we were working on integrating our patient data, into our fundraising database. We use the uh, Avila Millennium uh, database. Um, when we, as a business, we started looking at this expanded uh, direct mail program, we turned to the oversight tool to try to find ways that we could uh, be more efficient and effective with dealing with all of these external needs coming in. So um, the way we have been doing uh, duplicate management historically with the direct mail vendor was um, far from perfect. So we've um, using this tool to, to help with that. Again, we were we were operating in the finance office. The only thing we knew about uh, development was we received direct mail sometimes and often give, uh, gave. Um, my wife was a development executive for the National Kidney Foundation before we had kids. So when um, we received the the call uh, when we received the the call to to talk about the the business problem of name matching in the in the constituent area, it was at least a, a problem that was familiar to us. Again, our heritage was internal audit. It was internal control. Is invoice zero one two three four and invoice one two three four the same? Gee, same amount, same day. Uh, same vendor, maybe we ought to go look at that before the, uh, the duplicate payment would get made. And the analysis of identifying duplicates and importantly really shortening that, that life cycle in the, the duplicate world, for those of you that have friends in accounting and finance, you might hire a, a firm to come look at a year or two years or three years worth of data and they'll be paid a percentage of how many overpayments they identify and, uh, and collect back. 
with the continuous controls monitoring technology, we take Monday's invoices and compare them to the last two or three years worth of invoices. And before the check run on Tuesday, we can identify whether any of those invoices may be a duplicate. So not our idea, it was actually some of the technology folks at MD Anderson that said, hey, if, if we're trying to step up the, the, the volume of name acquisition, whether it's patient name or lease names in the development office, maybe some of that same technology in the finance area can help development. So we said, I don't know, let's, let's understand the, the problem, let's understand the business questions that are being asked and answered, and then let's try it. And we took a test file with um, what was a, a small file to us, and I think a, a big file to, uh, to the institution, and we said these are the names that we think are, are potentially duplicate, and we set up a pile of match and no match and maybe match, and the feedback we got was these are names that we were already told were no match from our, uh, our system house, but yet you, uh, you found some things that are really interesting. So that became kind of the, the onset to, um, to to really put the, the wheels in motion for this uh, this implementation of the continuous controls monitor. A little bit about the, the technology, and certainly anybody that wants to talk more about how it about how it works, would be happy to, to spend some time with you um, uh, after the, the session or on a, a break over the next couple of days. But the, the takeaway really is that we're integrating data from multiple data sources. It combines ETL technology, some ad hoc analytics, workflow, and also visual reporting. And all of those four tools are um, what we call the platform. It's, it's a, a business process platform that various business questions can be put upon and the, the, the platform helps answer those questions. So the original platform was finance and accounts payable, um, and the new platform is, uh, is development. The software is not my company, it's Visual Risk IQ, we're people that implement this technology. The software comes from a software vendor in Atlanta called Oversight Systems. If you want to um, have uh, expense reports reviewed or accounts payable, uh, invoices analyzed for duplicates. You would go to Oversight. If you come from a development background and you call the Oversight, they would say call Visual Risk IQ. We implement Visual Risk IQ implements Oversight for development offices. But just a, a little bit about that technology. Um, it, uh, it it was really well received by the by the finance office, and I'd be remiss of, of saying that we didn't didn't pay for ourselves in about three months. The entire investment, software, hardware, internal people and consultants, just through finding those, those duplicate payments kind of way back on day one. We also helped with compliance and deduping the vendor file and identifying some hidden relationships. That's one of the keywords, platform, but then also hidden relationships between the employee master file and the vendor master file. Nobody wants to have their employees moonlighting as vendors or consultants, right? So understanding the, the relationship and the timing of that became important. And the same query logic that we use to identify some of the, the business questions that folks in finance were interested in, we answered similar questions we developed. So here's a little bit about uh, the kinds of questions that we're asking and answering. Um, vocabulary, just entity, the name, so we have the existing constituent name and the acquired name, and we run it through what we call an integrity check, or just a, business, a set of business questions and business rules that say, is the name similar, is the address similar, is the, there, do we have a cell phone number contact or a phone number contact, do we have a birth date, all of these other indicators depending on what indicators we have, we begin to identify some of the relationships and make a recommendation to a, a data quality or a data management analyst. We think these two entities are related to each other, we think they're not related to each other, or that they may be. So 
beauty is the one that we know that aren't related, we don't have to bother that with them. Typically the vast majority. So we've got 10 plus different uh, data elements that we're comparing between files. If there's not a match, then we go ahead and add the acquired name to the main constituent database as part of that, that mailing. If we think there may be a match, uh, or if it's definitely a match, then there's different workflow um, for that. When we began, it was entirely match or no match with the, the maybe, but now it's more than that. We're also beginning to identify family relationships. And that's been something that's been very valuable. Okay, so some of the things that we're doing. Um, so again, if I simplify this tool is, is it's an integration engine, if you will. It's taking external data and reformatting and passing it um, into our uh, data you can update the system. But in the middle, it's, it's checking and, and, and looking at commonalities between existing records and helping us make a decision to this constituent exists, yes or no. If they do match, is it a firm match, or is it one that we need to look at and make a decision? Does it match to more than one record? We've got 1.6 million constituent records on our database, and a fair amount of duplicates just that exist inside of it. So in addition to finding this matches to this record, we can also see the other matches to these three records. So which one am I going to decide to maintain. That's where the human comes in, but they're only having to look at those babies, right? And all the other ones are pretty much done. In our, uh... So in the past six months, we've uh, processed about seven million records through the solution. Um, on our GIF records, our GIF files that are coming in electronically, we're matching at a pretty high rate, almost 50% of the uh, Get files that we get match up to existing donors. Um, the lease names we're finding um, about 5,000 with the mail files that we process. It's about 1%, which is a low percentage, and a um, acceptable duplicate percentage for the mail house. Um, but 5,000 people that are being sent a piece that shouldn't be goes back to relationships, right? You want to be able to show that you, I know who you are, I know I've mailed to you before, I don't want to just be sending you, if it appears like junk mail. And you know, some people will perceive it as junk mail and, and not respond to it, and that's okay, that's the, that's the risk and the, and the gamble that you do on large bulk um, mailing, right? That's all in the numbers game. But um, when you know if this person and you can treat them as though you know that's the um, percentage that are going to say, I like the and I like how they treat each other. So the other thing is, um, every night, um, one of the integrity checks that runs, so, so we're, we're pushing in all these external files through oversight, and it's helping us process those files and make decisions about how to update the Every night, though, it takes a, uh, that's what's called a slurp of mineral. So it's going to find out all the new activity that happened in the main database. And it can know what's new and different from yesterday because it maintains a copy of, you know, a subset of data that you can find. So we can do these comparisons. Um, so every night we have um, a function that says something that happened in the database today somebody manually going in and creating a record to post a gift, somebody updating an address on an existing record, adding a new address. Some activity has now caused that record to potentially match an existing record um, that's already there, that wasn't noticed when we were first updating it. So we find those every night. Sadly, we don't have the manpower, we're challenged with the manpower to actually fix those duplicates and work the duplicates. Um, ideally, you, you can know how that record got updated or inserted and you know the team that was responsible for it. And 
ideally send it back to the source of the person that created it so they can learn and, and be a little more careful. But the volume at which we manage has been a challenge for us. That should be about that. Um, and then the other thing that happens, um, similar to this change might be a duplicate, we have a concept of a, um, this match might be a family. We know it's not the same person. They don't have the same gender, but they share the same surname, they share the same address. Maybe they have the same gender, but their dates of birth are, you know, a generation apart, so maybe they're father-son. Finding these family relationships have been really, really important um, as well. We are cancer center. We obviously treat patients. And um, interestingly, a small percentage of our donations come from patients and their families. A huge percentage of our dollars come from patients and patient families. So our major gifts come from people that have an affinity to the institution. That makes sense, right? Yes. Did you want questions now? Or sure. I'm Have wondering you? how you determine relationships. Um, how we it's really, I mean, I, I agree with you, it's crucial. How did you do it? We're, we're matching and we're finding, obviously, it's a household match, if you will. Kind of so based that. on just address? Based on an address, based on the surname, and then being able to know that it's not the same person. Uh -huh. we, have, we integrate our patient data every two weeks. It used to take us six weeks to run these files through. We do it in a day now. It's a, we find patients registered that have family that are already in our database. And we're, we may not know the nature of that relationship. Typically, you can look at a date of birth and a male female, and maybe you surmise that they're married. You can go out to uh, LexisNexis and you know, confirm that and do that additional research that you need to do that to establish a spousal relationship. But at a minimum, we'll establish a family family relationship. And it allows us to tie these people together. It's a huge benefit to our future gift officers. I find that a lot of donors, though, are grown ups and don't live with their parents anymore. So. I'm sure. for it's, tricks. It's, it's not perfect. I yeah. mean, it's, it's finding the obvious ones, but you wouldn't find them otherwise, unless you were you know, searching and doing this from a research perspective. This is just exposing all this stuff so we can quickly put a relationship out there that then when the prospect researcher is looking at that constituent, they might be doing some more additional work and, and finding out all those other people. Yeah? Specific to your patient, constituents. Uh, so when a patient comes through the doors for the first time, they'll have a record created in your system. Uh -huh. Is there any uh, specific um, matching criteria you use for their subsequent second and third patient contacts or is it the same so, particular process? So we're a cancer institution, so we kind of like a long-term care facility if you think about it that way. So a patient registers one time and then they're a patient for life long time, that's all right? Because they get treated, well they get diagnosed, they get treated, and then there's going to be ongoing follow-up care. Um, so we don't necessarily, every time they come in the door, we're not re-registering them, we're not accounting for them. So when they first register as a, as a patient to the MD Anderson, that's when we um, identify them on our system. We have uh, weekly updates with our patient systems to then, based on that common key of their um, network number, what's the last outpatient visit they think they had, and, and some of that more uh, activity related information. We also have different views into those data sets to help us keep up with, with the patients based on the data that we're allowed to have from them. And that's a good question. That was actually more of the origin of the, the, the project, the analysis project, if you will, was help us understand how to integrate patient names with donor names and look for some of the some of the commonality. So, 
Can you repeat yeah, the question? Yeah, so our development office is part of... The, the question was about HIPAA concerns and HIPAA oh. privacy. So how HIPAA gets defined in your institution is based on how your institution is organized. So a lot of um, health institutions might have a, a separate foundation, and those are going to have different rules and guidelines. We are considered part and parcel to the business operation of MD Anderson. So we're allowed to have, we're allowed to know that you're a patient, basic demographic, uh, address, phone number, email, contact information. Um, when you, um, your visit information, uh, and we actually store the registration date and the last outpatient um, or inpatient date on our, on our database. And then future appointment information we from other sources and make it available to our um, field officers. So part of what they'll do is actually just, they might have a patient or a patient family in their portfolio. They'll go and just do a courtesy visit with the patient when you're coming to Houston for treatment or follow-up or whatever, just a, it's, it's not a fundraising uh, encounter, but it's a, it's a support and a, and a so we and recently with the HIPAA changes that were made back in September, we can also now know our uh, the doctor, Dr. Wars, and in the uh, department of service. So we're actually using that to help us on another. Um, I'm talking about that tomorrow. Um, focusing in on how we can uh, identify potential prospects for those new job programs. So, um, yeah, understanding them. And, and working legally within the HIPAA constraints is very, very important. So you said you were a little resource constrained when it came to actually fixing the difference between something just because of the volume. Mm -hmm. um, are you triaging? One of our huge concerns is, is we did an analysis this past year, we might have quarter a million dudes that are out there, um, both on the EMR side and on the development side. And now we're about to one EMR, it seems a little better, but. Um, one of our major concerns is people who opted out opted them out on a record. So are you triaging at least so you try to capture those because you know, if we're mailing to someone who's already opted out That's a huge that huge thing. Because yeah. you know somebody and, and we're doing some work with uh, opting out now and it's new stuff we're actually uh, migrating this this Friday when I get back to the office. Um, to keep up with that opt-out um, stuff. But, I mean, we're just the development office and we've got these handful of things that we're responsible for mailing, but the institution is doing all kinds of stuff. So, within the last year, the development office is aligned with the marketing office and the public affairs office. So, organizationally, that's been a big thing to kind of bring all of these uh, groups under one VP. We still haven't really seen, you know, that synergy and that, that only thing, but I mean, the idea is there to make sense. We've been operating separately, but even every clinical department has the leukemia newsletter, and they're sending stuff out, you know, to patients. So the whole concept of an institutional CRM or you know the old school master person index kind of thing, knowing who everybody is, and you know when they say, please take me off your list, do they mean the list of that? Solicitation I just sent you, or and sometimes you talk in the tone, you know, every <laughs> list, right? So, but you know, we don't even really know what all this is like. So it's a challenge for us as well. But we recognize it, and we're trying to figure out ways to, to do that. And I wish I, I don't know what this is. Always a challenge. Yes. Question back. Uh, my question is also about the resources that you're bringing to take care of those maybe. Uh, you actually have putting your hands on that and um, what kind of progress are they making? That's part of this problem. So within the development office, we have the luxury of a data management team. And they were um, put in place um, quite a few years ago. Um, really when we um, migrated over to the Millennium system from our old system, we had had the, um, sorry I'm like grassing, but, um, used to be that if you made an update to the database, you had to fill out a form and you sent it to the team that was responsible for keying stuff in. And we, we said, that's crazy. 
and we changed that and we said if you are the source of this information, it's incumbent on you to enter it and enter it correctly. So with that change, we said, okay, we've got to be monitoring the quality of what's going in and there's data rules and all those kind of things that you have to have in order to have the reporting and, and stuff like that. So we um, implemented this data management team that first and foremost, they define rules and they monitor ongoing the, the, the data we capture is captured correctly. So we have a team now, it, um, we also do all this integration. Um, there's a team of four that they do that full time. But you take a file through oversight with 5,000 records in it, and it's processed in three minutes, and then you have to just look at the handful of records that are, you know, questionable, and you can see them. You'll see you can see them in a kind of side by side uh, grid kind of way, as well as drill down and really look at uh, record A versus record B, or maybe you know there's three that possibly match to this. Which one? And you can there's additional data available for you to look at, so you can make that decision. You set a status on it, and you're done. And then out spits a file that then goes into uh, an import tool into our system. So. It's very quick um, in terms of processing a file. But I realize that a lot of offices don't have the luxury of that. The, the, the way that I would answer the, the question, the, the way that I would answer that, that question about data management and data quality, if we think about what, what data management or data quality is, we compare the thing in our left hand to the thing in our right hand, and if they're okay, we put it in the okay pile. And for every okay, sorry, that's another way. For every not okay, there's an awful lot of stuff that's okay. And the process of sorting, what do I really need to pay attention to versus what is okay? So much time is spent sorting, there's not enough time left for the analysis of the May matches. And what the, the technology and the processes that we've put in place, we, we have the technology make the easier decisions. Definitely not a match, definitely a match. Now the, the data quality group focuses on the maybe, and um, that, that's where the wows um, tend to come from. And I wanted to, to share one of those. There, there's, a, there's a reason that, um, that my partner and I work with MD Anderson um, Cancer Center, and there's a reason that we're here at the, the DRIVE conference. The, the social impact of finding a duplicate invoice and helping the hardware store get money back from, you know, the the tool vendor is not the same as making cancer history. And one of the things that has been a kind of a side benefit of the the, the duplicate analysis here, we're also in several cases finding the patient um, record that has been identified as a match to a donor record, a new patient record is identified as a match to that same existing donor record. So and we're finding dupes within the patient system that the patient system support teams are not finding. And, and there have been, and I wanted to read one of them, on more than one occasion, Andrew and the data management team has received tr uh, tremendous gratitude from the clinical side about how the donor management system helps keep patient records accurate. It's rewarding to see the impact of the tool and the investment that the office has, has made in development and the impact that it's having on the clinical world. So I'm willing to do as many projects as you know we possibly can in this world because it, it makes a difference in a way that some of the stuff we, we do for others just doesn't, doesn't matter. We're helping his heart be good. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Could you uh, go into a little bit more detail about the type of social media campaigns and how the debating process helps your social media? So that's an area that we're, we're just inching into. We haven't done much uh, time with that. We, we do have uh, a, a new philanthropy system that we are um, rolling out and, and getting stronger with. So obviously the, the online donations that are coming in um, 
are, again, kind of that integration engine. It's everything filters through the oversight that comes inbound to um, our system, unless it's manual. Um, so we're doing, obviously, the donations. Um, one of the things that we're also working on is sharing that opt-out information. So if the donor that goes online to say, add me to this list, take me off that list kind of thing, we're sharing. So we, because we get a lot of those requests manually that go into our manual system and source, so we've got bi-directional um, pieces like that. And we're not doing a whole lot with actual behavior information yet. But again, Does that answer your question? Well, we're looking into uh, more of the crowdsourcing, fundraising, and you know that's all just email address, people LinkedIn address, and so on. So we're we're getting into that world where we're going to have a name and an email address and not have a uh, physical address. Um, but with those, we'll also have a key to the online system that will we'll cross reference. Two questions, actually. First one, just quick. Uh, where's this? Where's the implementation hosted? Is it hosted internally with you, or is it? It's hosted internal with us because again, we I happened upon this technology happily because it already existed in, at my institution being used in the funding system. So yeah, it is hosted on servers in our data center and um, supported by our internal IT um, wherewithal to for that. Um, I didn't know we had this tool until I just had conversations with some of my peers in an IT division. And that, that was, again, it was like they're matching things. And we said, OK, we need to match things. It's different things. But it's the same concept. So we ran with that. And luckily, we didn't have a big upfront um, financial cost because of that. But Joe will uh, tell you that um, there's now a hosted cloud opportunity you don't have to necessarily have that investment in, in hardware. We committed, we, we committed to have three takeaways um, from the session, so I do want to get to the, the second one. But but this was a big learning for me, again, coming from the, the finance world, right? Is the invoice in my left hand a duplicate of the invoice in my right? If I identify 50 in the maybe pile and send an auditor to go look at them for five or 10 minutes a piece, for a $50,000 duplicate that we find, if we find one hit out of 50 maybes, we've paid for the auditor for months and months. But in the development world, if I don't put a real maybe in the stack for every match or no match that slides through, the, the cost of that false positive or the cost of that false negative is very different. The takeaway for you all who are looking to identify family relationships, looking to identify duplicates, looking to identify correlation between master data, you need to create a test file. Put a couple of hundred records that J-O-N, J-O-H-N, flip the road to a lane to a street, have a suite number, don't have a suite number. You need a, a test file that is robust with identifying what your definition of a human maybe is in what your definition of a human match or no match is and then run your algorithms against your test data until you get something that looks and feels right. It, it's, it's identical to going to the eye doctor, right? Which prescription do you like? Number one or number two? Number two or number three? And, and that's the, the analysis that we did with, with Nancy and the team. It had to be north of six or eight runs before everybody was truly satisfied with what showed up in the maybe pile and, and what showed up in the match or no match pile. Yes, we have software that does this. We'd love to test our maybe algorithm against your, your, um, your definition, but you can do this without. Did you actually calculate a cost or return? No, we have not. Um, but I do know that I could tell you that, you know, we would have um, duplicate data runs that had a six week start to finish interval that we did pay a service momentarily for that money. 
but the big gain is, is that now what used to take six weeks now is done in four hours and it, it's just all more real time. Um, Way updates are automatically updated, and again, you're finding those internal matches that um, exist. So <clears throat> it's always a challenging question to do the ROI. It's easy to do on the financial side, <coughs> but it's, it's more of that just customer service, knowing who this donor is, recognizing that they are, who they are, matching them to their historical giving versus creating another record. All that. Very the, the data folks in the room know that these are really hard, right? How do I identify Lee Kwan and Lee Kwan with a, a typo or a substitution or a SoundX type algorithm? Because if I turn on SoundX, I'm going to have more maybes than any data management team can go look at. But if I don't have some level of manipulation, I might let this, this go through. So we just tried to identify what some of the techniques were that we've used to identify these as maybes and kind of challenge your, your team. And much like I heard in one of the earlier sessions, and there's the, the reward for the algorithm that identifies what Netflix movie um, somebody wants to rent, there's an internal competition, whether it's, it's uh, lunch or uh, a gift card or something uh, much, much more significant. Which algorithm, number one or number two, number two or number three, is going to yield the, the best um, relationship between match, no match, and may match in, um, in your world? Um, and, and thank you for the, the question on, on cloud. It was not a plant, um, but I, I appreciate it. I, again, we're, we're internal audit folks. We, you know, a small firm, six or eight of us, and we've been at this for, gosh, uh, we're in our eighth year. And this is our first um, development office client, and it's not our software. We've successfully gone back to the software vendor and said, we don't think internally hosted is for everybody. We hear this problem with other development offices. They have two sets of files, and they'd like to do a one-time comparison. Do we have a way to offer an ROI that's so many pennies per name or um, some flat fee and, and could be done on a one-time basis. If we can do that for someone and our matching is no better than what you've been doing internal, I don't want to take away from your, your development resources. We need to, to make that a, a no-cost assignment and we'll apologize for having taken your time. But if we're good and we're able to, to find things and, and help identify relationships that you've not been able to do, or you've not been able to identify without the, the help, then that may suggest the need for some periodic, again, it needn't be multiple times per day, but perhaps it's a once a year or a once a quarter, and we are building the, the relationship with the software vendor to allow us to offer this in an on-demand fashion, in addition to the hosting, uh, internally hosted, hardware hosted, um, that's running at, uh, at MD Anderson. Um, the, uh, yeah, so um, again, the impact from our data management team has been huge. Um, and one of the, Andrew um, is one of the guys that um, works this system on a daily basis, and he had an interesting analogy. It's, it's not comparing, you know, a through Z, even though you're doing that, you're taking all the data here and you're looking at all the data here, you really, the value is, is you're playing, you're validating Y to Z. It's just those ones that you need to touch that are brought to your attention and you're only spending the time on the ones that require the time. And that's been the value. Um, and you can do so much more with the limited resource that you have because you're not having to just either deal with tons of duplicates in your database and you know the impact of that and the downstream cost of those or you're not having to just look at every single record before you're uh, bringing it in. And you're able to automate so much more of it. 
Um, and then the other, um, just comment again from our data management team, it's really transformed how they've done everything um, and, and take processes that were batch oriented and, and back and forth and it take a long time to just being done all in real time. So, huge impact from us. And from the, our metrics analyst perspective, the impact of these family relationships is a huge increase, hundreds of percentage increase in the number of family relationships that we are able to identify in our database. And the translation of that to the major gift officer has been significant, especially when we know that so many of our dollars are coming from patients and patient families. So we know that identify that group of people has been doing So a few other things, we're working on email opt-out with our e-philanthropy system. We've got a solution going live uh, Friday where we're actually, it's, it's a, the ability to actually query into the oversight data that looks at both your required names that haven't made a gift yet, as well as your um, constituent base, do a query on those. So to handle all of the return mail, the voicemails that are left to say, please take them off the list, please mail them just once a year. You mailed to my mother and she passed away two years ago to capture that information so we know not to buy the names again. So that's um, going to be big. And other things that uh, we'll be doing is really based on some kind of the business initiatives that the development office has. Um, my role has been involved, and in, I've been involved with the development office in Anderson for the last 15 years. And we are just doing data handoffs mm -hmm. and, and data integrations back and forth. And it's only going to be one. We start working with the third party members that are you know, thanking and calling donors and they're finding out information about the attending things. It's just a constant, constant back and forth. So this tool in the kind of center of things is really been a good maybe close with, with takeaways, right? This was an existing enterprise tool that was licensed and paid for in, in use by another department. There's, there, there's, there's, something, there's something that that you're trying to solve that somebody else in some other department may have a head start on. So the, the Drive Conference is great. It connects advancement and development professionals with other advancement and development professional data professionals. But there are other data people that are not in advancement um, inside your institution, and there may be some things you can learn from them. Um, the, the second takeaway, we talked a little bit about the, the technique of match and may match and how to make that a, an iterative process. And again, this is um, you know, something that we have on, available on the cloud platform. That's why we're here. We're looking to, to test and make sure that we're constantly um, getting better with, with how we do this, and we're willing to make some investments to help us understand is this something that, that will have value to, uh, to other folks in the, uh, in the advancement and development world. And, and if it is, um, again, it's much more socially, uh, social impact than, uh, than hammers and accounts payable invoices and things like that. So um, you know, certainly let's, let's exchange contact information and we'd love to hear more about the, the kinds of questions like to ask any of We're out of time, but any last questions? All right, well, I'm going to do with the white here, so if you do have a question, you can probably recognize me.